We doing good today? Um, I've been gone for a couple of weeks. I, I took my family to Europe uh, on a on a two week vacation. We got home. We were home for 24 hours, and then we went to Arizona to celebrate my wife's grandfather's 80th birthday. If you if you are friends with us on any of the social media platforms, then uh, you're welcome. We took you to Europe with us for free. Uh, man, it just has been a, an incredible kind of a whirlwind uh, couple of weeks for us, and we're just really excited to be home, to be honest. Um, really glad to have gotten the time away, but thankful to be right back with our family. Uh, we've been praying for you. We've been missing you while you're gone, uh, while we were gone. Um, but we also know that you've been having some good times while we were away. I know Pastor Mark brought a good word and wrapped up our Fight Club series, and Pastor Danny and, and Cheryl and the youth ministry took over the church last week, and that was awesome. Good job, guys. Uh, saw you guys rocking your outlet T-shirts. Some of you doing it today as well. That's pretty cool. Um, man, we're just really excited about what God is doing in every age group in, in Life Church right now. And as I was saying a few moments ago, we are celebrating a 90-year anniversary of this church this month. That's pretty incredible. Pretty amazing. Um, what have you been doing for the last 90 years? I know, me too. I've been thinking about old stuff a lot recently. Uh, I was, like I said, I was in England and I was, I was driving around all kinds of places and we drove from the south of, of England all the way up to into Scotland and uh, we took a, this ferry across some water to the island of the Isle of Arran, uh, which I think you're supposed to pronounce Arran because you roll everything with the R in Scotland. Um, and I had haggis over there, um, which is like the hot dog of, of fried foods uh, in Scotland. It's, and it's surprisingly delicious. It sounds awful. Um, but you eat hot dogs, so don't judge me. So um, we, we saw some castles. We saw some places where there used to be castles. We saw some churches. We went to Paris, and we saw Notre Dame. Uh, and, and I kept being struck by how there are things in this place that are older than where I live. It, like, it's interesting. We're celebrating 90 years, and we go, 90 years? Oh, my goodness. In California, 90 years is a long time. In Europe, 90 years is cute. <laughs> As we were telling people over in Europe, like, yeah, our church is 90 years old. And they go, oh, so you're just getting started. Okay. <laughs> All right, neat. Call us when you're 400. Yeah. God has been doing a lot, actually, in 90 years in our church. And, and while I've been thinking about old things, I've been, I've been struck by how easy it is for the passage of time to cause people to think that God can't do a new thing in an old place. And I, I've been struck by how hopeless you can become when you start adding up the years. And I've just been thinking about that while I was away. I've been thinking about you. And one of my main prayers for our church is, God, do not let 90 years be a sign that we're done. Right? Uh, don't let 90 years be a celebration of a race having been run well. But let 90 years be a really good gun to start a race that we're running now. Yeah? That's, I, I don't know if everybody would agree with me, but... You can look at 90 years and go, man, 90 years. Whew. What could you do now that you're 90? I don't know if you've ever felt like this. Um, and, and by the way, you can, be, you can be 15 and feel like you're too old for anything anymore. Especially, in, and I, I know it sounds funny, but um, the world that we live in now is strategically designed. I'm going to say something. This might sound a little radical. The world we live in today is strategically designed by the devil to destroy hope as quickly as possible. So we've got a bunch of young people sitting over here, many of whom feel uh, a stronger sense of hopelessness because of the things they've encountered that some of us would never understand because in all of our years, we haven't seen what they've already seen. It's hard. It's hard to 
hold on to hope. And it's hard to hold on to God's promise. It's hard to hold on to God's word. And it's hard to expect that God would do something fresh and new when you add up the years, or you look at what has happened. And I've just been chewing on this over the last couple of weeks as I've been away. And, and I've been really having this sense that if I could come and just encourage you. In fact, I almost felt like, and I was sharing this with a couple of our overseers this morning, I almost felt like God was saying, you know what, if you could just come and talk to your church family, like you were the one who was the 90-year-old, and you're just going to talk to a bunch of people who are just getting started. So I know I, I've got a little bit of gray hair, so you're going to have to extend your belief just a, just a bit more. The heart I'm coming at you today with, just a simple word, is... When you feel like it's too late, when you feel like too much has happened for you to be able to receive the promise that God has for you, I believe that God's got a word for you to encourage you so that you could see the promise that God has. So like when you came up for prayer and you feel like nothing happened and the person next to you got healed and you had to sit back down in pain, I feel like God sent me with this message to say, don't give up on the promise just because of what it feels like today. And the person that I have kept coming back around to, in fact, it's not just one person, it's a, a married couple that I kept coming back around to in scripture uh, as I was thinking about, man, 90 years is such a long time and yet something new could possibly happen and how do we hold on to hope and what can we learn about that is, is this couple, Abraham and Sarah in scripture. And, and as I've been thinking about old things, I was thinking about how in Genesis chapter 17, 18, you get into Genesis chapter 21, you see this story laid out through scripture over a a number of years uh, in just a few chapters in scripture about this married couple, Abraham and Sarah, who God really was fans of these people. He really liked these people and he made some pretty radical promises to them. Uh, in fact, in Genesis 15, uh, you see this promise that, that Abraham then called Abram is going to be a father. He's going to be a dad. And Abram's like, all right, yeah, we'll figure that out. Because he was already a pretty old dude. And so they go about trying to figure that out. And then you get into Genesis chapter 17, and God is talking to Abraham again. And, and he's talking to Abraham about this promise. By then, he's, he's, he was called Abram. He's changed his name to Abraham. And he's about to change his wife's name from Sarai to Sarah, which we'll get into the meaning of why that happens some other time. But in Genesis chapter 17, uh, I just want to read to you kind of this story quickly. Uh, starting in verse 15, we start seeing this conversation that Abraham and God are having. And by the way, just what I want to do for you today is kind of share this the way I heard it, which was the story first and then some thoughts. So if you give me permission to read the Bible today at church, I'm going to read to you this story. Uh, and then we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna jump to another place in the New Testament. And I just want to put something in context for you. And then I'm going to share a couple of thoughts that I've got for you. And then we'll see about getting out of here. Sound good? All right. You were excited about the getting out of here part. No? Okay. Uh, God, would you just help me to say this the way I heard it? Would you help me to share with my friends and family today what you want me to say in a way that would be encouraging? And would you use your word to heal the hopeless places in our lives uh, today as we dig into your word? In Jesus' name, amen. Genesis chapter 17, verse 15, it says, Then God said to Abraham, regarding Sarai, your wife, her name will no longer be Sarai. From now on, her name will be Sarah, and I will bless her and give you a son from her. Yes, I will bless her richly, and she will become a mother of many nations. Uh, I, I love, by the way, that it says that, um, because a lot of times we just go, oh, father of many nations. We neglect that this was a, a promise for the couple. Um, that God believes in fathers of nations. He also believes in mothers of nations. Uh, so even in the Old Testament, yes, women in ministry. Uh, and many, women with incredible callings. Um, he goes on, he says, kings of nations will be among her descendants. Then Abraham bowed down to the ground, but he laughed to himself in disbelief is what it says in the New Living Translation. If you go into the original text, that phrase in disbelief is actually not there. Just so in context, it says he laughed to himself. It does not say he laughed to himself in disbelief, but uh, let's, let's continue. Uh, I actually don't know why they put that in this, in this translation, but here's what he thought as he laughed to himself. How could I become a father at the age of 100, he thought. And how can Sarah have a baby when she is 90 years old? 
So Abraham said to God, may Ishmael live under your special blessing. Ishmael was Abraham's other son. When God told him, hey, you're going to have a son and uh, I'm going to bless him and you're going to become the father of many nations, Abraham and Sarah, Abram and Sarai at that point had this conversation. They go, you know how we're super old uh, and I've never been able to have kids, Sarai says. Uh, I came up with a plan. So Sarai's plan was, uh, why don't you go and sleep with one of the servant girls uh, that's in our family, in our household, and then when she becomes pregnant, then uh, that will be your son, and that's how God will fulfill his promise. And so he had, this, he had this son, he named him Ishmael, and then when God comes back around in Genesis 17 and says, hey, you're going to be the father of many nations, uh, it's going to be super awesome, and, and Sarah is going to be Sarah, and she's going to be the mother of many nations, Abram's, Abraham's response to that is, yeah, I totally agree with you, God. <laughs> like, Ishmael, let it let like let let my version of your plan uh, work out. All right, we'll come back to that. <laughs> Verse nineteen. But God said no. We could probably just pack it up right there. But let's keep going. He says, Sarah, your wife, will give birth to a son for you. You will name him Isaac, and I will confirm my covenant with him and his descendants as an everlasting covenant. Just. Uh, for context for something I'll probably say to you a little bit later in verse 20, it says, as for Ishmael, I will bless him also, just as you have asked, I will make him extremely fruitful and multiply his descendants. He will become the father of 12 princes and he will make, and I will make him a great nation. But my covenant will be confirmed with Isaac, who will be born to you and Sarah about this time next year. When God had finished speaking, he left Abraham. Now, if you skip down to verse uh, verse 9 of chapter 18, the story continues. Where is Sarah, your wife? The visitors ask. By the way, the visitors in this context actually is uh, God shows up uh, back again to Abraham. And in this context, he says, where's your wife, Sarah? She's inside the tent, Abraham replied. This is uh, Genesis 18, verse 10. Then one of them said, I will return to you about this time next year, and your wife, Sarah, will have a son. Sarah was listening to this conversation from the tent. Abraham and Sarah were both very old by this time, and Sarah was long past the age of having children. So she laughed silently to herself and said, how could a worn out woman, her words, not mine, like me enjoy such pleasure, especially when my master, my husband, is also so old? (laughs) Then the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh? Why did she say, can an old woman like me have a baby? Is anything too hard for the Lord? Drop the mic. I will return about this time next year, and Sarah will have a son. Sarah was, Sarah was afraid, so she denied it, saying, I didn't laugh. But the Lord said, no, you did laugh. <laughs> then they got up and they left. And you skip over to chapter 21 of the book of Genesis, and we see the culmination of the story that I want to share with you today, which goes like this. The Lord kept his word and did for Sarah exactly as he had promised. She became pregnant, and she gave birth to a son for Abraham in his old age. This happened at just the time God had said it would, and Abraham named their son Isaac. Eight days after Isaac was born, Abraham circumcised him, and God had, as God had commanded, Abraham was 100 years old when Isaac was born. And Sarah declared, God has brought me laughter. All who hear about this will laugh with me. Who would have said, uh, who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse a baby? Yet I have given Abraham a son in his old age. Now, that's the story in its context. I want to read to you in the book of Romans a reference to this story that is uh, very well known in the New Testament in Romans chapter 4. And then we'll be done, and then I want to share a couple of, we'll be done reading. I just want to share a couple of thoughts with you. Paul says in the book of Romans, so this promise, so the promise, the promise of God is received by faith. Faith is a funny uh, word in the Bible. We, we often think it means believing really hard. Faith actually means taking action according to what you believe, right? 
Uh, so, this promise is received by faith. It is given as a free gift, and we are all certain to receive it whether or not we live according to the law of Moses if we have faith like Abraham. So, the context here is that he's actually talking about the, the relationship that we have offered to us with Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. Uh, this is a promise that is received by faith. It's given to all as a free gift. We're certain to receive it whether or not we live according to the law of Moses if we have faith like Abraham's. For Abram, Abraham is the father of all who believe. That is what the scriptures mean when God told him, I have made you the father of many nations. This happened because Abraham believed in the God who brings the dead back to life and who creates new things out of nothing. Or like makes 90-year-old women who are too old to have a baby pregnant. Verse 18, even when there was no reason for hope, Abraham kept hoping. In the New King James Version, that says, uh, Abraham hoped against hope. So even when there was no reason for hope, Abraham kept hoping, believing that he would become the father of many nations. For God had said to him, that's how many descendants you will have. And Abraham's faith did not weaken, even though at about 100 years of age, he figured his body was as good as dead. And so was Sarah's womb. Abraham never wavered in believing God's promise. In fact, his faith grew stronger, and in this he brought glory to God. He was fully convinced that God was able to do whatever he promises. That's a good word, right? Now, there's three things that came to my mind as I was reading this story and thinking about this idea uh, that at 90 years old, this This old woman, too old for God to do anything new, would receive this promise of brand new life that was going to come. And the first thing that I thought, the first first observation that I want to share with you as we're thinking about what do I want to do to make sure that I can receive the promises that God might have in my life, or what do I do if it feels like it's been too long or it's too late or I've, I've messed it up somehow, The first thing that jumped out at me is the laughter in this story in Genesis. And I think that God is saying we should learn to laugh about it when we hear a promise. Now, that seems maybe a little bit unchristian to say when God gives you a promise, you know, the first thing that you should do is you should laugh at God. You know, it's interesting to me that God doesn't rebuke the laughter in the story. The thing he corrected in the story was when Sarah lied about the laughter. That's interesting. He doesn't say, how dare you laugh? You're not getting the promise. (laughs) Right? He, he, He teaches them. He uses it as a teaching moment. He says, why are you laughing? I'm the God who could do anything. Right? Come on. Don't leave it at laughter. Right? But he doesn't go, how dare you laugh at me? You can't be in relationship with me anymore because you laughed at me. You know what's interesting is that the laughter is an indication of an awareness of the re- reality of the present moment. Let me say that to you in another way. They laughed because they were old. <laughs> and having a baby is not something that old people do. I'm 33, and I'm already like, I don't want to have another kid. Did you hear that? (laughs) Too old. (laughs) Rebuke that. Now we're having a competition of which one of us is going to hear from the Lord. <clears throat> oh my gosh, this is taking a turn. <laughs> Have you ever heard God say something to you and your initial reaction was <laughs> Can I tell you a story of a time that that I that happened to me? So I was 17 years old, and I got invited to be the children's pastor at this church. That lasted for six months because I was really bad at it. So then I got uh, reallocated, 
as being the associate pastor, which was Pastor Jan's way of saying, you don't know what you're doing, sit in the office adjacent to mine and don't touch anything. <laughs> and learn a lot. Uh, and then he, he was, he, he got in cahoots with my wife and were like, you're, you're going to Bible college. And they made me go twice. Ugh. I'm really thankful for that. Actually, I'm thankful for this season where when it was really dangerous for me um, to be a leader, they let me be one. Uh, and Pastor Jan was hugely responsible for the trajectory of my ministry. And in the middle of that season, when I was about 18 years old, was the first time as I was standing behind the, 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 the podium of this church preaching on a Wednesday night, I had finished preaching and I heard very clearly the Holy Spirit uh, drop this sense into my heart. Now, I'm using all kinds of words for that. Basically, what I, what I mean is I knew in that moment that God was telling me something. And what he was telling me is, one day you are going to be the senior pastor of this church. Now, at 18, I had a Joseph moment. The Joseph moment is, are you going to tell the people in your life what God just said to you, or are you going to be smart? And I, I don't know that I was. I told a couple of people. Um, and then we served for about five years as the associate pastors here at the church. And our older daughter, Hannah, was, was born while we were serving this church. And when she was about six months old, we felt like God was telling us uh, that it was time to move, which didn't jive with the you're going to be the senior pastor of this church one day. But God was doing a lot of different stuff, and we were immature, and we felt like God was saying this thing, that it was time for us to move on. Uh, and, and we believe that we, I still today believe that I heard the Lord say that, but the way we did it was really ugly. It was really immature, and we burned a lot of bridges here. And, like, we left with people, some of you are sitting in the room, not being our fans. Thanks for forgiving us. And, uh, and, and I'm, I'm not kidding you at all. When I say when I left this place, we moved to Arizona. We were there for 365 days. I swore I was never going to set foot back in the Antelope Valley. It was exactly one year later to the day was the first time I set foot in the Antelope Valley. And the Lord gave me a word. I'm calling you back to this place as a missionary. And I thought, cool, we'll plant a church in Lancaster. Well, that ended up happening. Um, cause I came back here, I visited a couple times and the Lord said very clearly, I remember standing right in between the, the two sets of double doors right there. And the Lord said to me very, very clearly, there's no room for you here. And I thought, well, God, I thought you called me home. I thought certainly you're going to find a way to do this crazy, awesome miracle. And like at 22, I think I was at the time, you're going to have me take over this church, which is super arrogant when the guy leading the church isn't ready to go anywhere. <laughs> This is me telling you, like, God does miracles with people. Um, so we ended up serving at the Highlands for two and a half years. Two and a half years uh, of serving at the Highlands, growing up a lot and learning. We planted this church called Life Church. That went on for five years until one day, um, and, all, and by the way, all the while, God is increasingly telling me, you're going to be the senior pastor of Lancaster Foursquare Church one day. It got to the point where other people who had no reason of knowing any of our story would come to me and say, I feel like God is calling you to go pastor the church you grew up at. And I go, stop saying that. I, was actually, I actually found myself in conversations with leaders in our denomination, and I'd be like, could you please stop saying that? Because I, I know the guy. Who's pastoring the church? I love Jan Spencer, and at this time, God had worked out all of our relational stuff, and I asked for forgiveness for being a dumb young person, and he forgave me. Thank God. Isn't it great that you have people who let you grow up? Old people, let the young people in your life grow up. Young people, grow up. But so by that time, all of our relationships had been healed, and, and, and yet it still just looked crazy that it, God would ever call us back, and yet this thing kept happening where it felt like God was saying, you're going to go home, you're going to go pastor this church, and I didn't know how that was ever going to happen, and, and, and we're pastoring this thriving, growing church, and then Jan Spencer calls me up on, on a day I'm on my way over to preach at the Desert Christian High School Chapel, and he says, hey... Um, I'm going to retire from ministry. The Lord's told me that my time senior pastoring is, is coming to an end, and I know your church is looking for a larger building. How about you use ours, and we merge our churches together? And in, I almost crashed my car. I had, to, I had to park just so that I could finish the conversation and then call my wife and then cry 
in that order. Um, because it was in that moment that, that God brought back in to my story, I'm going to do the thing that I told you I was going to do. And you know, if I'm going to be really honest, it, over the course of the next several months before we actually had our Converge Sunday, which happened in August uh, a few years ago, where we officially merged our two churches together, there were a couple of times where I, I looked at God and I said, can I, just, can I just do what you want to do with the church plant? Like there were a couple of moments where I thought, this is hard. Can, I just, can we just stay where we are? And in my attempt to offer God my Ishmael, he said, no, I'm actually going to do something different. But one of the first reactions I ever had, and maybe the thousandth reaction I ever had and a bunch of times in between, when God would bring this up over and over and over again from when I was 18 years old to three years ago when it finally happened, God kept bringing this up. You're going to be the senior pastor of Lancaster Foursquare Church. One of the reactions that would come up from me and from my wife and from the people in our inner circle who we would trust with this narrative was, (laughs) that was a direct quote. (laughs) Because we had done so much to make it impossible for God to do what he had promised that he would do when I was 18. And yet here I am preaching this message as we launch the celebration month of the 90th anniversary of Lancaster Foursquare Church as the senior pastor. At 33 years old, God, like I'm living in the promise. Here's the point. God didn't remove the promise because I didn't see how he could do it when he gave it to me. Laughter doesn't kill the promise. It just makes you very aware of your present reality. I think a lot of times we look at our present reality and go, (laughs) God, you're so ridiculous. Of course you're wrong about that. And we actually turn our laughter into a rebuke against God's word instead of a humorous awareness that if God could really do that, wouldn't it be crazy? Do you see the subtle difference? The point is that Abraham and Sarah started their engagement with God's promise with laughter, but that's not where it ended. And if you've heard God promise you something that sounds crazy, like he could never do that, there's a good chance that's actually God. But if you've ended the conversation about his promise with, (laughs) no way, period, then you've stopped listening and you, you're missing the opportunity for God to say, no, 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 I really mean that. And by the way, God loves to say, no, I really mean that to his children. If you're going to give him the opportunity. Does it make sense? So you can begin your conversation at laughter. Just don't let it end there. The second thing that I I felt like was important for us to understand, and I've kind of alluded to this already, is that we we need to be willing to laugh about it. We need to be willing to to go, God, this is insane, what you want to do with my life. The second thing that I'm learning from this story is that we also need to make sure that we're going to wait for it. So we need to learn to laugh about it. We need to be okay to, God has a sense of humor. He thinks it's funny what he's doing with your life too, how you started and where he's got you going. He thinks that's funny too. So laugh about it, but also wait for it. You remember the thing about Ishmael? Ishmael is the perfect illustration of God's people not being patient. Thinking that, oh, you know what, it's taking too long. So I'm just going to figure this out in my, own, in my own timing, in my own way, in my own method. Sarah comes to Abraham and says, hey, you know what, let's just, let's just find a workaround and we'll, we'll get a son. And as long as it's a son, then we'll just call it the son that God promised and, and we'll just call it good. And I love that when God uh, hears Abraham offer Ishmael back up to him in Genesis, he says, hey, can you just do everything you're doing with this other kid? He goes, you know, God, I I love that God says, you know what, I'm going to actually bless him because you asked for it. But then he doesn't say, so I'm going to change my plan because you asked me to settle. 
And here's, as I was thinking about you this morning, here's what I, I feel like God actually really wants to say to you is, some of you have heard God's plan and his promise, and you've created an Ishmael in your life, and you've actually believed the lie that says, because there's an Ishmael, you can't get Isaac. Some of you, God told you to do something for him years ago, and you did something different and called it obedience, but it was just to the left of obedience. And you know, <laughs> come on, you know. You know, in the same way that when we were in England and we were driving on the other side of the road, I knew this is not right. <laughs> like it's just... It's driving, but it's just on the wrong side. Th that's how you know. I, I mean, I love Jesus, but I'm just not, like, completely living in his will. And that's you. I'm not saying that's all of you. I'm just saying I feel like God sent me to say this to some of you today. And then here's the promise. Just because you have an Ishmael, and you've chosen to, to offer that to God. God said, don't settle there. I might even bless that other thing, but that's not my plan for you. And no matter how late you think it is, I'm not done with my plan yet. I woke up this morning, just was, as, as I was preparing this morning, just had that sense. If I, if I could almost, if it would help you, if, if it would help you, I would say, thus saith the Lord. That, that's the sense that I have on that, is that I feel like God says prophetically, like as a promise to you, when you offered him your version of his promise, he says, I'm not going to rebuke you for it, but that's not my promise and you know it. But just because you offered me your version doesn't mean I'm not going to give you mine. Isn't that good? So for those of us who are feeling like, I'm just living just to the outside of God's promise of my life and his version of the way I'm supposed to be living. I don't care how long you've been living with Ishmael. God said, Isaac is still coming. My promise for you is still on the way. Amen? I just would hope that you would uh, receive that today. The lesson, by the way, is just, you know, if you haven't created an Ishmael yet, don't manufacture your own version of God's plan. Young people, be patient. I know everything tells you, if it doesn't refresh really quickly, just close the app and be done with Instagram for the day, right? If your Snapchat doesn't pop up immediately, then just, it just must not be God's will for your life to look at Snapchat. Side note, it's not God's will for your life to look at Snapchat, but that's a different sermon. But young people, when it feels like it's taking forever plus infinity for you to become who you think God has called you and created you to become, you're exactly in the right place. It's supposed to take longer than you think it should because that's how you know God is cooking the plan and the promise and you're not doing it in your own strength because your parents aren't even good enough to do everything that God has called them to do without God's help. So it's okay for you not to be as well. All right? You good? <laughs> We're good. Okay. Pastor Jim talked directly to me at church today. What do I do? The third thing is this, and I just want to I just want to wrap up with this thought, and then I want to pray for you. Is you have to learn to hope against hope, and this really is the thing that I've been wrestling with for a long time because I read in Romans chapter four that it says that uh, that Abraham never once. Uh, failed to believe God, and yet he laughed at God's promise. And I love that there's this, there's this juxtaposition between let me be honest about my present reality and still choose to believe God's promise. And if you're looking at your life and going, there's no possible way that God could do what he promised me because of what it currently looks like, and that's how I know, then you're in the perfect position to be like Abraham and hope against hope. When it says hope against hope, I actually love that promise, that, that language because it, it says to hope, it, it doesn't mean to wish. It's like faith doesn't mean to wish. It means to take action. Well, hope doesn't mean to wish. It means to live with expectation. Like I, I hope that when I say I love you to my wife, she says I love you back. 
That doesn't mean I wish that she would say I love you back. It means that I know our relationship so well that when I say I love you, she says I love you too. I hope it. I expect it. Which, by the way, because I expect it, it drives me to say it. In other words, because I know what's going to come back from her, I live a certain way. My hope, my expectation drives my faith, my action. Do you understand? All right. So if you understand that, then we can begin to understand what it means to live to hope against hope. Abraham had hope, an expectation of the promise of God against hope, everyone else's expectation of the present reality. Let me say this to you another way. He put his hope in the word of God instead of putting his hope in the world. I put my hope in the promise, you're going to have a son with Sarah, even though she's like 90. Put my hope in the promise, expect it, and align my faith according to it. How can I say this because there are children in the room? Faith is action because of what you expect. If you're expecting to have a child, there's a certain action that you need to engage in. So, okay, you got it. He aligned his hope and his faith with the word of God instead of aligning his faith. Well, I'm not going to go there because my hope is that it wouldn't work anyway. We're tracking. We're tracking. All right. I got the front row on the same page. (laughs) If you need to email me about that. Uh, Marcus, what's your email address? (laughs) Oh, boy. What would it look like if you aligned your action with what God told you he was going to do instead of aligning your action with what it feels like God could do? What, if, what would your life look like if you began to live according to the promise even if it looks impossible for you to receive the promise? Well, it's impossible for me to be the pastor of Lancaster Four Square Church because you burned bridges and you moved to Arizona and then you came back and God said, there's no room for you here. Well, what would it look like for you to hope against hope? Well, God said you're going to become the senior pastor of Lancaster Four Square Church. So the way he got me there is I hoped against hope. So I became a senior pastor of a Four Square Church in Lancaster. All right, I got like three out of four. I couldn't do the fourth. I was hoping against hope, but it's not like I said, well, I'm going to go become a mailman and just deliver other things because I burned that bridge. You tracking? What would your life look like if you began to live in a way that if God was going to supernaturally charge his promise and keep his word despite what it looks like, that you would actually be in a position to actually catch that ball if he threw it to you? So many of us stop the conversation about promise with laughter. And we go, no, I'm not even going to go to Bible college and, and learn how to minister the word of God because I just don't believe that I could, right? I'm not even going to position myself to become what God has told me he was going to make me. And you stop that, no, that's impossible. Many of us stop that, I'm going to do that, but I'm going to do it my way. And many of us stopped at, well, but circumstances happened, or I was going to do this, I had this dream, and then, you know what we say, and then life happened. And God came to give you life and life more abundantly. So when the devil comes to steal and kill and destroy the hope that he has given you of the dream that, and the promise that he has planted in you, the thing that if you close your eyes right now and you could be exactly what God created you to be and it looks impossible from where you're sitting today, what would it look like for you to begin to align your life so that it would be a little bit more possible? So that if then God would do a miracle, it would become a reality. 
That's what it looks like to hope against hope. To hope when it looks hopeless. And I just feel like God is saying, you know what? I'm not going to do anything in your life. Unless you're willing to take some steps of faith to position yourself to actually receive it. I, I feel like I'm not a baseball fan. Amen. Okay. <laughs> but if you, were on a, if you were on a baseball team and your coach said, go out to left field and we're just going to practice hitting some balls out there and you're going to catch them. And you ran out to right field. You put your glove on and you stand there waiting. You're never going to catch the ball because that's not where the ball's going. What would it look like for you to actually at least get into the right position? God is never going to hit you the ball if you're standing in the wrong place. If he told you to stand over here. You understand? God is never going to keep his promise to you if you're not positioned to receive it. But if you would just hope against hope, if you would just believe that it's not too late, if you would just position your life to say, you know what, I know what it looks like, but God's not done with me yet because he wasn't done with Sarah when she was too old to have kids. If God can do that, then he can do this in my life. And I believe that at 90 years old, God is saying to Life Church, a group of people doing life together and having faith in Jesus together, you know what, it's not too late. It's not too late. Behold, I'm doing something new. Can you not see it? Are you ready to receive it? God, I pray for my friends today that we would be able to receive the promises that you have written for each of our lives. Your word says in Ephesians 2.10 that we are your masterpiece, that you created us before we were even born with a purpose and a plan for good works, with good works in mind that we should walk them out. Your word says in Jeremiah 29, 11, that you have a plan for every single one of us. And God, there are some of us who absolutely have not believed your plan for our lives because it sounds too good to be true. And I pray that you would increase our ability to have hope and to believe your word and your promise about our lives. I pray that you would increase our patience to be able to allow you to have your way in our lives instead of trying to come up with it on our own. And I pray that you would help us to hope against hope, to believe that your word is going to come to pass even when it looks completely impossible. Help us, God, to get out of the way of your promise and just get into the rhythm, as it says in the message translation, to get into the unforced rhythms of grace. Help us to quit trying so hard and just to learn what it would look like to position our lives to receive your promise for our lives. God, I declare that over these people and I declare that over this church, that there is a promise, a bunch of promises you have for these people and for this church. I pray that we would never get in the way of you having your way with our lives and with this church. I just want to end this moment. I feel like it was important for me not to just share that word with you, but to give you an opportunity to respond to it. And the way you respond to that is not to say anything to me, but just to take a moment and respond to Jesus to respond to God. I believe that the Holy Spirit is ministering right now to some people in this room who are saying to God, I'm hearing you, I'm hearing you talk to me about that thing you promised me. I thought it wasn't ever going to be possible, but you just told me, and maybe you're not done with me yet, God. Can you just take a minute and have that conversation with the Lord? Maybe you need to repent for calling God a liar, for leaving the conversation at laughter, for giving up, for creating something different. Maybe, maybe you need to stop offering God your version of God's promise and you need to make a commitment to him. God, right now I'm committing to be patient and wait for your version of the promise for my life. Some of you feel like you're too old or you've been too much of a sinner or you've uh, lived too much the wrong way or in too much the wrong place or done the wrong job for too long or whatever. You feel like it's, there's no hope. There's just no way that God could do anything. Well, you were hopeless and God saved you. 
And God fulfilling his promise about what he wants to do with your life was, is going to be easier than what he had to go through to save you. And he did that when you didn't deserve it. And if you live in a relationship with Jesus, you deserve more today to receive the fullness of the kingdom than you did when he offered you free salvation. So this is easier. No matter how hard you think it is for God to keep his promise in your life, this is easier than it was for you to get saved. And God did that because he loves you. Hmm. Just take another moment and just have that dialogue with the Lord. You might be just kind of having a sense right now. In fact, there might even be some people who are getting like a picture of something that they're supposed to do. So you just are having like, a, like an image of yourself doing something. You just ask the Lord right now, God, is that from you? Is that you? Do you want me to do that? Lord, I pray for those of, those of us in this room who you're giving those images to, those prophetic pictures of the next step that we're supposed to take. Lord, I just pray that you would give us the courage and the boldness to obey you in what you just showed to us. Some of you, it wasn't a picture, it was some words or a sense of something. I believe the Holy Spirit is speaking to you right now. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. Good. Well, God, I, I pray that as we leave from this place that you would give us courage. One of the promises you repeat over and over and over again in the word is to be strong and courageous. And so, God, I pray for my friends that they would be strong and courageous, that you would give them the strength to stick it out and wait for you to keep your promise. They would be courageous so that they would do everything you have called them to do to be positioned to receive it. And then, God, as we become people who are so overwhelmed by the promise that you have kept in our lives, make us people who shine a light of telling the story of how you have kept your promise. Make us a church full of people who have been fully blessed by God, receiving overflowing life from Jesus so that we could have a good story to tell, not about us, but about how good you've been, so that we could use that as a tool to share the good news of Jesus so that other people would come to saving faith in Jesus Christ. Thank you, God. Can you just take a moment and just say thank you for his promise in your life, for the promises that you've already received and the promise that uh, you are still waiting to see? Just say thank you to him, because, man, it's, what a gift to get to hear from, from God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord.